Owen Gutenbeel. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Between Two Beers. <laughs> Thanks, man. Nice to be here. We're in Export Beer Garden Studio tonight, but you're 100 days sober, we were just talking about? Well, that's, yeah, that's always my aim each year. I try and do 100 days sober. And um, yeah, normally it's during winter. Um, enjoy the summertime, but this year I thought I need to start with a bit of an attention. Um, yeah, off the back of an interesting few years with business and stuff, I thought, yeah, why not do it from New Year's? So. Yeah, trying to trying to get that roll going. Sure, surely in the old Mad Monday days, though, you must have mixed a couple of exports with a few DB bitters back oh, in the day. Oh, you know it, you know it. <laughs> well, the DB bitter yeah, was they used to drop pallets off to the to the um, to training, and you could take as much as you wanted, and there was always beers left over because it wasn't. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and these boys, you know, didn't take anything for free, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was still there. DB bitter, not when, so good. Loyal to the bitter end, eh? When you come to some concept like hundred days sober. Do you actually, Mark, do you think on the 100th day, are you having a drink? Uh, yeah, sometimes, but but um, this time, yeah, I don't, don't really feel like it, so we'll just see how it rolls. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting that we did a, what was it, 96 or a 72-hour fast, Stephen and I. We kind of decided to do it, and then I got to 72 and was like, well, let's just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going, keep going. You're never going to eat anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 did, I did eat again, just, just, just to be very, very clear. Um, but yeah, you kind of do, eh? You, you, yeah. don't, you don't just kind of mark it off and go, oh, I'm just going to go and smash a huge feed or drink a box of booze. Yeah, although your mates do. They're like, okay, we've marked down the day. We're going <laughs> yeah. to lunch and we're getting on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't let them know when that 100th day is. Yeah. Hey, um, so... At the end of every episode we do, we ask our guests to recommend someone they think would make a great episode. Yep. And Melody Robinson wrote down your name. And we said, hell yeah. Uh, Shay has been on at me for ages that we're overdue a leaguey. We are overdue a And league. he's right. Yeah, I think we had Monty Beetham was our last one. That was over a year ago. Um, but the word that Melody used to describe you was depth. She said, a great storyteller with real depth. So I'm really looking forward to digging into to your whole story. But before we get there, there's a few bits and pieces that we want to dig around in. And we've gone to a variety of uh, sources and oh, friends and, and colleagues just, uh, <laughs> just for some stuff to get to know you. Well, and, and just just a precursor, sometimes these are fizzes as well. Sometimes yeah. people give us stuff yeah, and it just goes nowhere. So yeah, nice. It's, yeah. it's uh, yeah. licorice yeah. all sorts. Let's yeah. see where we land. Fair enough. Yeah, but we've been suggested to ask, your nickname is La. And what's that from? Oh, man, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's... So my, my uncles were um, involved with Richmond Rugby League and they had a, had a crew down there that were called the La Horse. And, uh, yeah, obviously the name's interesting. Um, and they used to play touch and play footy together and, yeah, so they'd sit up on the bank and drink. And, and one of the guys that was involved with that group was Tony Tumavavi. And when he came to the Chief, yeah, when he came to the Warriors, I was there as a youngster um, and they'd call each other La. So, so he started calling me La and that was it. It just sort stuck. Of, sort of stuck, yeah. That's oh, yeah. almost the... Uh uh, a tip of the cap to you and your your heritage there, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, yeah, it's rather flattering when uh, when the ladies were like, "Ooh, damn!" I'm like, if "You only knew the real story." <laughs> 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 the large hands, man. The lie. These large hands lie. Makes your dick feel real small. <laughs> It's nice. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah. First one's hit. First one's hit. Yeah. <laughs> so another tip we had is ask him if he still owns the motorhome, which is like Narnia and has a never-ending supply of pals. <laughs> <laughs> I know who said that. Um, yeah, we do. We do actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, motorhome. Yeah, love it. We bought it maybe four four summers ago. Wanted to um, sort of travel with the kids while they were young enough, and they still wanted to hang out with mum and dad on on summer holidays. So yeah, still got it. We call it Bruce. Bruce nice. the camper van, yeah, it's good. Fun. Where's the best place Bruce has been to in this great land of ours? Uh, we've been down to the South Island a few times. We've we've spent New Year's in Queenstown a couple of times, and yeah, we've done all the South Island. We haven't done the East Coast, and I don't think we'll get there for a while with the roads washed out. Yeah, 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 yeah. but yeah, good fun. And up north, I did a little camper van trip up north. It was amazing. Yeah, places yeah. I never knew existed. Yeah, beautiful up there. Well, I'm I'm born from in Whangarei, so um, north's home for me. So I always always try and head north if I can. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Next awesome. tip is, and I don't know if our correspondent has got this wrong, but said after a few drinks, he loves to do a Barry Manilow voice. But we think this tipster means Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> or is it Barry Manilow? Well, no, it wouldn't be Barry Manilow. Yeah, no. exactly. No, 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 it'd be Barry White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A few drinks and, uh, yeah, well I, well, I haven't pulled it out for, for uh, what is, what we're going, well, nearing that 100 days, sort of halfway, so. Yeah. Sort of forgot how it goes. Same, same tips to said you have an amazing voice that you don't pull out often enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Very enthusiastic when I've had a few drinks, um, but I wouldn't say I'm great. 
Is it? Yeah. No one ever does, but they yeah. are. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, better yeah. with age. Yeah, yeah, does, your voice does get better with age. I'm was a firm it? advocate of that. For those wondering what we're talking about, it was something like an oh yeah. yeah. He's like yeah, there. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's good. Bring out those bassy tones. <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay, we're on a roll. Uh, and can you tell us a bit about your daughter? Um, offered a music contract in seventh form at the moment. Like, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What does that mean to be offered a music contract? Yeah, pretty cool. That um, her and, and three of her mates um, from Intermediate sort of put a band together, and, and <laughs> when they're at Intermediate, they do the talent quest and stuff. And there was seven at the time. And, and remember, you, as a parent, you go along and watch all these talent quests, and you're like, oh, man, this is rubbish. You know, hurry up! I want to get out of here. But, you know, you sort of uh, pay homage to your, your child to support them. And, and they got up there, and they were, they were okay. The second year, um, a couple of them sort of dropped off, and, and I was like, "Damn, they're actually pretty good." Yeah. Um, so they, they kicked on through high school, and yeah, they, they've been um, really successful for young girls trying to trying to um, grow up and, and understand you know what it is to be an adult or, or a teenager and, and stuff. And yeah, they got um, offered a gig with with a pretty um, well known band in, in New Zealand, and and um, they've produced and, and written some songs themselves and it's um yeah it's interesting now that they're in seventh form and they're all looking at what happens next for them are they traveling um down down the line for university and stuff and um yeah who knows where that's going to go but um yeah daughter Mila she's extremely talented awesome you left school at 17 and went overseas and played rugby league are there any similarities when you're thinking about her st- starting a career in a, in a different uh, direction like is, is there any transferable skills you pass on or advice um I, th- I think it's um we just we just let her sort of um come up with what she wants to do so, so we never really pushed her into music my wife's um a musician yeah she plays and sings um on the guitar and yeah we never really pushed her into that and, and she picked it up at at um i guess it was form one and and started asking for music lessons and and from there she just yeah, really loves it and, and is often at home writing her own music and, and coming up with uh, with new sounds and, and new songs. And it's really interesting to see her from when she first started it and then to where she is now with a boyfriend and the depth of song and all that sort of ah. stuff, sorts of change, you know, and you start going, hey, yeah, you just start <laughs> whoa, the what you talking about, girl? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you listen to the lyrics, hey, you're like, lyrics. oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That's, it's, that's, that's really cool. That's, that's a, a really that's interesting a window. Tra- yeah, I imagine you learn more about your daughter. There's stuff she wouldn't share with you, perhaps, but then you hear it through song. That's, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. It is cool, it is cool. But, you yeah, know, we're just supportive of, of both our uh, children and, and what they want to do and, and – haven't put pressure on them to be anything other than what they what they want to be, you know, and, and um, yeah, it seems to be working out well. Yeah, nice. Um, last one before we get into it, and uh, tough act to follow because we're asking for a Mike Tyson story, and the last Mike Tyson story we had was Shane Cameron. Go back and listen to the Shane Cameron episode if you want to hear a really great <laughs> yeah, no, Mike I'm, Tyson story. I've heard Shane tell that story a few times, yeah. Um, but we've seen in our notes that you have met Shane uh, Mike Tyson before. Yeah, yeah. So I um, was over in Las Vegas, and he, and he was doing a, um, a, like, a like a stand-up, show for uh, for people and, and you pay a ticket and go along and watch and it's about an hour sort of show that he gets up and just talks about his life um just him on stage and it was it was pretty amazing he has an earpiece and it's it's as if he's playing something through and he's just he's just repeating uh the stories that are, that are being told through his earpiece but fascinating fascinating um story great storyteller extremely honest and um yeah just the journey he's been on and and um yeah, yeah, just just really incredible. I was extremely nervous afterwards. I managed to get up and get a photo with him, and yeah, he, he's he's not the not the tallest dude, man, but he was the man, you know. Yeah. You know, growing up watching watching uh, watching him fight, you're just like this guy, he's the man. Did he still have that aura about him that even just in his presence, you kind of go, "Whoa, this dude is a cad, could be a bad man when he wanted to." Oh, be. absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, yeah, I was nervous, and and you're kind of like, man, I, I feel blessed to be to be in his presence. Awesome. Yeah. And it, is it like an audio book come to life? Is he animated when he's telling these yeah, stories? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, totally animated. It, um, yeah, it blew me away, actually. I was thinking, how's he going to stand up there and talk for an hour um, yeah. about his life and, and have it be entertaining because you, know, you, you see interviews of him and, and he um, could go <laughs> either way um, you know, with a the, with the high-pitched voice. But no, it was, it was really, really um, entertaining and, and yeah, it took a lot, a lot away from it. Awesome. I'm going to start painting the the picture now of Owen Gutenbeel. Um and I want to go back to the start. Uh, growing up in Whangarei, it's it's amazing the amount of high. 
high-profile successful sports people we have that come from smaller towns, but we'll get to that later. Um, a little bit of a selfish angle. I'm in the process of growing a big family, and I know you came from a big family, one of five. And I wondered if you could reflect on what you remember from, from growing up in a bit. Like, was, it, was it a good childhood? Was it healthy, competitive? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there was uh, three of us that were a bit older and then and two siblings that were, that were younger. Um, and, and we grew up around sports, so... Um, yeah, basketball was was probably our, our main love, and then um, rugby league was our was our religion on a Sunday. So my grandparents sort of ran the Portland Panthers. Uh, Mum and Dad were involved with the West End Jumbos. Um, so so it was always it was always rugby league on a on a Sunday, and every day during the week it was either basketball or, or athletics or or something else. So um, I, I in, in terms of the five of us growing up, uh, two younger siblings, and then uh, a brother that's one year younger than me. My older brother was four years older. And, and they'd share a room and I'd be in my own room. So, so it was always them. It felt like they were always picking up on me, uh, picking on me. So, yeah, I, I was out there to, to beat the world. And, and if I could beat them, um, then, then I knew that I was, I was going to hold my own in the family. And I was, I was a rather violent kid <laughs> growing up, trying to prove myself, you know. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. My, my, uh, my dad's side of the family the, um, of, of Tongan heritage. Um, living in Ponsonby, so that was um, always amazing to catch up with them. They, they played rugby league all their sort of junior years, playing for the junior Kiwis and stuff. So they were they were our idols. Mum's brothers um, similarly played uh, for Northland. So it was uh, yeah had some had some really good um, role models to, to aspire to to be like in the sporting realm. Before we get to some of your challenges, um, what was it like playing against Piero Cameron? in terms of basketball growing up in Whangarei? Because I gather he was your, your classmate or your form classmate at Whangarei Boys? Yeah, look, he was, he was a few years um, older than me. Um, but my first ever game of rugby league was playing for the Portland Panthers when I was three. And Piero was in the, in the same team. Yeah, he would have been five or something. So. Wow, three uh, years old playing rugby league? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if you can class, classify it as, as playing. Mum said I was uh, running around picking up mushrooms for her. <laughs> 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 but, but I was out there anyway, you know, and, and that's kind of, uh, I guess that was free babysitting on a Sunday. They chuck the kids in a, in a footy jumper and th- uh, throw them out on the footy pitch. But yeah, Piero was, uh, was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, but there were was, was so many um, other guys that were in and around the similar age that, that were um, into basketball and it was it was really cool to um, sort of grow up aspiring to be like them. I just want to circle back to one thing you said, they're violent um, kid growing up, violent. Because you're a bit like Monty Beetham, like the nicest, most softly spoken, most genuine, everyone I've talked to has said you're the nicest guy. But you've also seen that, you know, you can handle yourself in the boxing ring or on a rugby league field. Were you a big unit Growing up, like, did violent mean you got in fights on, on the playground? Like, wh- what was that side of you? Uh, I, th- I think it was probably couldn't express myself um, verbally. So so I'd just get pent up and, and build up some anger. And I remember chasing uh, my older brother around the house with a knife and trying to hold him down and all that sort of stuff. So mum and dad uh, cancelled Guy Fawkes for me and sent me to <laughs> karate for, uh, for three or four years to try and temper my anger. Um, but, yeah, uh, through that sort of journey and, and um, you know, uh, getting sick as a, as a kid for for a period of time too that sort of tempered that and yeah it's interesting now because um, I, I try and stay as far away from that um, aspect of my life as I can so so any conflict I'm like hell no I can't go anywhere near that because I, I probably don't trust myself yeah um the the sickness you talked about it seems like quite a, a defining moment of your childhood um, the first time perhaps you overcame real adversity can you tell us a little bit about about what happened yeah so I remember um, I would have been nine and it was our athletics day at school and, and I was I was keen to try and prove that I was um, that I was as good as the other kids and, and make mum and dad proud of me so I was really stoked to get up and and uh, and get into it I remember waking up in the morning getting out of bed and I, and I couldn't and uh, and I'm sort of I remember we had a long hallway in our house and, and sort of leaning against the wall trying to get myself um, down to the kitchen where mum was. And um, she thought I was just trying to trying to pull a sickie so I didn't have to go to athletics. And um, I was like, no, I'm actually, I, I can't walk. And, and so she called my grandfather. Um, he came around and, and took me to the hospital and, and uh, I was in hospital for maybe two or three weeks and they couldn't understand what was wrong with me. Um, and yeah, they, they sort of ran a whole lot of different scenarios that I might have had who knows who knows what really and, and they I remember um, being in the hospital bed and, and mum and dad were outside and the doctors were talking to them and, and I remember overhearing um, them say to mum and dad that there's a likelihood that I might not be able to walk again and I was like shit that's pretty serious 
Um, and um, I, I was, I guess, fortunate it wasn't wasn't that. Um, and sort of two or three weeks later, they they diagnosed me as having rheumatic fever, um, so a heart condition. And um, I was in hospital for yeah, maybe several months um, until I could I could get well enough to to get out of hospital. Um, and yeah, it, it was um, probably the first time that I looked at. Um, setting goals for myself and being able to overcome some sort of adversity. Um, the first goal that I had was to be able to go outside and play with my brothers. Um, and then it was climb a tree. And then it was to do, you know, um, go out there and hang out with my mates on a weekend. And um, yeah, so from the age of, would have been nine to 11, um, I wasn't allowed to, to sort of hang out with my mates and, and do anything like that because they were a bit worried about me catching um, other bugs that would uh, affect my heart even more. Wow, how frustrating is that as a nine to eleven year old? Like you look, you're thinking about it now with adult eyes and adult mind. But as a kid, like I can't imagine some of the like frustration. I don't have kids myself, but frustration of little kids not being able to do what they want to do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 it was. It was. And 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 when you have kids now, you you know, I look back and I go, wow, man, that was pretty heavy. I'd, I'd hate for um, I'd hate for my children to to have to go through that journey. And then um, I also am extremely th- Thankful that um, you know it wasn't at the at the most severe end of, of having rheumatic fever and, and needing open heart surgery. Um, yeah, and, and I guess reframing things for me is is that sometimes things happen for a reason. You know, they don't happen to you; they happen for you. And, and um, although I wouldn't like to go through that again, um, I've taken the the, the learnings and, and the lessons from it, and um, that's that's shaped me to who I am today. Wow. Yeah, we're going to get to a little bit later the the injury setbacks and overcoming adversity again. But overcoming this was it the surrounding framework of support from friends and family that helped you get through that? Like looking at it as now a, a father with that lens on, do you think back to how how people helped you through? Yeah, I, I um, it probably I'm sure it would have, um, but I went um, at that time. Um, into this, this sort of insular um, person that felt like I was on my own island and it, I was the one that was going to control my destiny. Um, so, yeah, probably probably um, did the opposite, although I know that there was, there was plenty of support and um, love for my, for my family and the wider um, network that, that I was surrounded with. Um, yeah, but for me, it, it, it probably reprogrammed um, something in me to go, you're in control of, of what you do, and it's up to you. That's a crazy mindset to have <laughs> at that age. That's that's yeah. un, that's insane. Yeah, um, where, yeah, yeah. yeah, like where where does where do you think that comes from? I don't know, man. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of um, looking back now. I, I think that's that's kind of how that was shaped, and then that's helped me overcome some some other stuff in my life, and and. It worked really well for me to um, achieve some of the some of the things I have, um, whether it was sporting or, or professional, um, the professional side of my life. Um, it doesn't necessarily work really well in a relationship. <laughs> Let me give you a tip. <laughs> <laughs> fast fast forward a couple of years. Did that sense of, of being on an island or that sense of I've got to control my own destiny make it easier for you to leave Whangarei and come down to Auckland and, and come to high school down here? Yeah, I, th- I think it did. Um, it, yeah, definitely did. Definitely did. I remember being asked when I was thirteen whether I wanted to leave home and move to Auckland, um, and yeah, that was the first time that I was attracted to fear. You know, that that really scared me, and I was like, "What's what's the worst that could happen?" You know, just say yes and then deal with the consequences later. So, yeah, I, I don't think I would have done that had I not have gone through that that journey with rheumatic fever and and sort of um, framed in my mind. Um, that that I was in control of where where I wanted to be. Do you remember coming out the other end of it and a moment where you were thinking I'm a hundred percent again? And you, you're obviously like an incredible a- athletic specimen. Was there a point where you're like, right, I'm going to sort of beast this world? I'm I'm going to. Did you start dominating athletics days and cross countries and sprints and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, I um, I probably did. I remember surprising the. I don't know if I was I was going to beat the world, but I just wanted to prove to myself that I was as good as. Um, the other kids. Um, I remember in Form 2, um, which I just sort of come out of, of being able to, again, participate in sport and stuff and um, surprising the teachers because um, I, I signed up for every athletics um, event at the, at the um, sort of intermediate athletics day. 
and and um, yeah, um, did did rather well and become the you know, Whangarei Intermediate Senior Boys Intermediate Champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> still, <laughs> still got the record. Yeah, I'm must. not sure, man. I, I know I know they have one. Uh, record at Whangarei Boys High, um, third form triple jump. Isn't that funny? Those records still stand, and, and people yeah. like us still talk about <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was really cool. Was like, so my older brother, he was seventh form, and I was third form. And I remember them doing this triple jump, and I, I was like, "What the hell's triple jump, man?" Um, and they're like, "Oh, you you run and you do this hop and a skip and then a jump." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, I get it. All right, sweet." And uh, my brother was one of the, the judges, sort of measuring out for the juniors. Um, and I've gone to do it, and I've done it the first one. And I've jumped further than all the seventh formers. And they're like, well, no, wait, wait, wait. He doesn't know what he's doing, surely. Do it again. I did it again. And uh, yeah, and, and beat all the seventh formers at, at third form. Awesome. Yeah, wow. So that was cool. So I had the bragging rights. Yeah. yeah. The, the sort of legend starts spreading then when you get a third <laughs> yeah, former out jumping the seventh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that still stands, uh, stands up at Whangarei Boys today. And was it that sporting prowess that attracted... Well, that brought you into the radar of Calston, or was it an, uh, an organic shift to, to Auckland? Uh, no, it was actually, um, I played in the under-13 uh, league tournament for Northland, and, and there was, you know, there's was there been a few defining moments that, that I can recall clearly. Um, one of them was, uh, it was probably um, obviously having rheumatic fever and, and, and changing my mindset. Um, the next one was, I remember driving down to uh, Topol, the, the North Island under-13 league team, or uh, league competition was there, I remember sitting in the front seat, my dad uh, driving and the manager, um, and, and she had a son in the team, and, and we're driving down. I, I put on some, um, I think it was... This is uh, going to be great. I can, I can just picture the moment <laughs> of time. Yeah, man. Whatever yeah, song yeah, you yeah. come up with, it's yeah. going to take me to yeah, that yeah, moment. Yeah. It was Mr. Telephone Man. You know, it was playing, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. And I remember uh, t- turning to dad and said, Dad, I'm going to make this, um, this North Island team. And, and the manager, um, who was in the passenger seat, I remember heard looking at me and laughing and just saying, there's no way you'd make that. I was like, you wait. And that was it, man. I was just like, all right, I'm going to prove you wrong. And then, yes, yeah, so I made that, that team. And then I got offered the opportunity to come down to Auckland. Um, John Ackland was putting together the first development sort of program wow. for, for rugby league um, here in Auckland. And he, and he said, well, if you want to be a part of this, we'll give you the spot, but you come, you've got to come down to Auckland. So that was, that was the reason I moved. So I moved down. Went to Westlake Boys. I stayed with my uh, auntie and uncle over the shore. Went to Westlake Boys for, for a period of time. Started or started school at Whangarei Boys. Come down for the league season. Finished at Whangarei Boys. And then the whole family moved to um, to Auckland. My, my eldest brother was going to university. So and we moved out west. And, oh, and that's, right. that's kind of how I ended up at, um, at Calston Boys. Was Sir Graham Henry the headmaster then? Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he used to give me shit all the time for not playing rugby. I was going to say, yeah, was, yeah, there, yeah, was there yeah, pressure? Was, to, cause yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive, massive pressure. So, yeah, I'd... I'd I uh, represent the school in swimming, in touch, uh, in basketball, athletics, um, but he would not make me a prefect unless I played rugby. Really? Did yeah. they have a first 13? Uh, or did no, you have to play club? No, no. So I, I just played club. We, we managed uh, maybe two or three years of me being there to get um, a team into the sort of weekend competition that they had, but there was never never any league. Wow. Um, and, and we got you know, the, the first 15 boys came and played, which was awesome. So Case Muse was was part of that and it was cool but yeah mum um called a meeting with uh with ted and went and sat down and and sort of said you stop giving my boy shit and, <laughs> and sort of sat him down and gave him the talking to but uh, me and me and um yeah graham henry get on really well and have a laugh about that man. amazing did you ever come close to switching codes um i did i did um only because uh, at school they were doing um exchanges sort of the <laughs> the um fifth form first 15 were going to Canada and doing all these overseas trips and I'd never been on a plane then you know and I'm and I'm 16 and I'm just going shit maybe maybe this is an opportunity for me to go on a plane um wow, I, is I, that right? I stayed I stayed strong and then um yeah the following year we you know the Auckland sort of development and the Warriors development team uh, where they put a development program together and that's when we traveled over, overseas yeah not long after that you're getting attention of in those days I guess was was it still Winfield Cup in those days or was it uh yeah 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 it was yeah of, yeah, of, yeah. of those scouts? Are they coming and watching your games here in Auckland? Or? No, they, they weren't actually. So we, we toured over to Australia and we played Penrith. Um, we played uh, another another side and, and then um, we, we played uh, Parramatta. So that's that's kind of where the scouts were hanging out and, and identifying talent from there. And is it around that time you link up with Stacey Jones? Like that friendship kind of connects at that point in time? Uh, that's when I came down um, to Auckland for that um, development sort of program. Um, 
my parents knew Stacey's parents um, and they, they were the ones that said, come and play for Point Chev. So when I, when I moved to Auckland, I played club footy for Point Chev, which is um, where Stacey was playing. So, yeah, some, from 14, um, yeah, all the way through, we sort of played a lot of footy together. That, when you when you just get the contract or, or whatever that, that Manly offer you and you <coughs> leave school to, to play for them, what are you at that point? Like, you, you, are, you a, are you one of the biggest... 17 year olds around are you known for your power and your pace is it your strategic thinking like what is the attraction to sign you yeah I, I'm you know, I was never the most talented um, athlete you know I, I really love basketball um, basketball is the game that I wanted to play and and um, yeah so sort of got offered to go down the basketball path at, at high school and, and sort of go over to the states and play basketball there but um, when I was third form I was six foot two um, when I was sixth form, when they were asking me to go play basketball, I was still six foot two. <laughs> I got to put two and two together. I can't dribble. I can I can bump people out of the way um, as a as a small forward, but I knew that basketball wasn't the way to go. And and um, you know, I guess yeah, I I, I worked really hard um, in in the sports that I was involved with and sort of set goals. And and I think that was probably one of the things that that. Uh, yeah, that, that sort of gave me the opportunities and, and I guess I could offload the ball a, a fair bit and had had decent enough feet to, to create space. So it was pretty cool. So, yeah, um, got Phil Gould when we played Penrith. He offered me a contract and then, um, yeah, it was it was Manly that, that I decided to go to under, under Bob, Bobby Fulton, who was the Aussie coach. But you, you didn't end up playing any games for Manly, right? And I need a little bit of explanation on this because it was a little bit before my time. Shay knows it well. The Super League... Stand off, trade off, and you and you bounce back to the Warriors. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So when I went over there, so ARL it was was the competition. So ARL um, ran the competition. Um, the CEO of Manly ran the ARL. Um, Bob Fulton, the Australian That's coach, right, yeah. obviously it was an ARL um, strong sort of side. <coughs> and um, yeah, it was it was actually interesting. There was a, there was a sort of precursor to that. Um, so I played one year at Manly. Um, they promised to put me through architecture school and all these art sort of um, degrees, and um, that was in my contract. You, know, you signed a contract to go over there. It was basically a tracksuit and and some meal vouchers. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm a, S- I'm a manly, <laughs> I'm a manly boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, and then I, I had in there that I wanted to do some tertiary education. So um, I went to apply for the the um, facility that I wanted to go to, and, and they sort of turned it down. And I was like, okay, that ain't cool. You're not living up to your side of the bargain. Um, and Dad's um, relations are the, are the Sorensons, and Sorensons, and the Sorensons were um, obviously at Cronulla. Um, so I gave um, uh, Dane Sorensen a call and just said, "Hey, look, I'm, you know, Manly haven't lived up to their side of the bargain. How's about um, I come over and join you guys?" And he was like, "Okay, sweet." So at this time, the Australian side was on tour um, over in in the UK. So I've gone over to preseason switch clubs. Um, Bob Fulton gets back from his uh, his tour, and the first thing he does is give me a call and, and gets my butt back over there and promises me the world. So um, I did a preseason with, uh, with with the Sharks, went to Al McPherson's parents' house for the for the Christmas party, and, and that, that was it. Never <laughs> and, and I got a t-shirt and, and some shorts. Just from him. pause yeah, there. Yeah, was, we might pause was, there. Was Al <laughs> in the house as well, or just the parents? I feel like this is a real critical part of the story. Here. <laughs> I wish she was there. Ah. No, she wasn't. No, 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 no. Just a couple yeah. of old people having, having, having a Christmas party. I oh, know exactly. Man, we're like, damn. A few pictures on the wall, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then, yeah, we went back um, to Manly, and and it was in would have been ninety four, ninety five, ninety five. Um, coming home from training one day, uh, Matthew Ridge and um, Ian Roberts had signed with Super League, and, and we, it was all the buzz was sort of happening at the moment. Well, at that time. Super League was uh, was kind of like um, the Live Golf Tour, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah. the Rebels coming in. That's, with a a great, mum, that's a great analogy. With a whole lot yeah. of money. And, and I just asked Reggie when he was dropping me off home, I was like, what's up with the Super League thing, man? And he's like, oh, I'll t- tell you what, though, they're actually talking about you. Um, would you be interested in going in and having having a sit down? I was like, hell yeah, hell yeah. So he arranged that, um, got my dad's cousin to come along with me, um, sat down in front of them and, and, and they sort of laid it out for us. You know, this is the vision. This is this is kind of where things are at. And was it John Rebo that you were you were meeting? Um, it wasn't John Rebo actually. Um, no, no. Uh, it was you know it was there was there was a few others that, that were involved with that. Um, but 
Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't um, <laughs> smite, smite, it's, that's a classic. It's, show, my, yeah. it's my league. It's my league nerd. And, and trying just, to drop a little bit it, of no, inside it, it knowledge. Was, in there. He was involved with it. Yeah, yeah. No, he was definitely just a Graham. Irrelevant. It, it was actually drop. It, it was actually Graham Lowe who who sat me down and and um, we went through it and whatever I was paid at the at Manly, um, they said said we'll give you double that, and uh, straight away I was thinking shit. Yeah. How old are you at this point? Uh, I was. And I, know, and I can see my friend over here getting yeah. excited because he's a money guy, so I was, he might I even was push I was 18 you. or 19 at the time. Yeah. And double that, I was like, hell yeah. And then uh, they said, uh, and that's as a sign-on, and, and we'll give you 100 and something grand a year, you know, Australian. And I'm just like, oh, how good is this? You know, it's just, and, and money back then, that's a lot of money. Like, that's a lot of money now. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of money, man. A lot of money now, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, being 19, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to milk this now. I, I, know, I know their game, so sort of, yeah. Push them back and forward, and you know, added, added a whole lot of travel costs and new car, and then there's tax to be paid. And, that, and are you are you a, a, a wily nineteen year old, or are you getting outside influence from people like Matthew Ridge suggesting, hey, Arwen, no, ask, ask for this, no, ask no, for this, no, or is no, it I, on you? No, I, I sort of negotiated all my contracts. Wow. Um, just yeah, yeah. You know, again, it's up to me. I'm on my own island, man. I got to make it work. So, yeah, ended up um, signing for Super League um, under the proviso that it was for a New Zealand side. Um, and that's, at, that, at that stage, the, the Warriors weren't, um, hadn't signed with Super League. So they eventually did, and then that's how I found myself back here at the, at the Warriors. And, and at Manly, you know, I was playing pre-season trials for first grade and stuff, and as soon as I told um, yeah, Bob Fulton, I gave him, remember giving him a call, and he was just like, shit, what, you're going you're gonna to be nothing. You know, that, that comp's not going to work. And um, that was it. I was on the bench for under 19s for the rest of the year. I was going to say because you still hadn't played a first. Had you played a first grade <coughs> game at that stage? No, 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 no. Just the just the preseason stuff with with the top side, and, and then went from there to to basically getting no time anywhere. And yeah. mm. one of our uh, tipsters <coughs> has suggested there might be a good story about. Um, your visit with Stacey Jones to Mel Meninga's pa- place <laughs> during all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that was that was part of the Super League day. So we we go down to Canberra and, and play down there. And there's yeah, there's there's another event that I won't um, give too much information about that happened the night before anyway. And, and those are the days when when uh, when we used to play a game, you'd have beers at the airport on the way home, you know, and and you just drink and drink on the plane, drink at the airports, all that sort of stuff, and and. That was all kosher. That was all play on, and growing up as a, as a youngster, that was that was what what was modelled from us. You know, so we're like, okay, we want to prove you're a man. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll drink with the with the older guys, and you know, we go we go on the the day after the game. Let's say it's a Sunday around there, and John John Rebo's there, um, and and they're giving a big <laughs> big chat about the Super League and what it's going to be like, and and um, you know, bringing everybody together, and we're going to have all these after functions that that don't normally happen in rugby league, and yeah, Mal's part of it and Laurie Daly and, and uh, you know, Bradley Clyde, all these guys are, are hanging around. We're having a, having a good chat with them. And, uh, Stacey's had a couple, couple, uh, probably too many and, and Mal comes over and starts talking and breaking down, you know, how he sees the, the comp going and how we can do things. And, and Stace, um, yeah, just looks straight at him and, and starts going, Hey Mal, what about D? <laughs> <laughs> just rubbing at his eyebrows. Hey? <laughs> we're just like, oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> it was all, uh, yeah. It, it was, it, it was all fun, but um, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah, fun times, you know. And, and how, how much the, the professional environment has changed since then, when it was okay to, to just, yeah, go full, full tack on the, on the way home from a game. That's yeah. a, that's a ballsy play. I ma- imagine Mel Meninga was quite an intimidating oh, man at that point. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. Now, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But he just, he just laughed it off. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, it was all good. It's an interesting point you raised because. Uh, Knowing what we all know now, like, do you think you could have prolonged your career had you looked after yourself a little bit better back in the in the prime playing days? I, I think um, potentially. Um, I think I got to thirty two, which is which is doing pretty well. Um, you know, those guys that, that push thirty five and, and stuff. But I don't think they would have they, they would have stopped the blunt force trauma that that um, I sort of put my body through. But I think I probably would have played a better game if if, if um, yeah it was. But adhered to the same sort of standards as there are um, today, and understood um, sports science. You know, we, we never understood that, um, so it was just, yeah. Um, I remember at Manly, um, it used to be a, a club training night on a Thursday, irrespective of um, whether you played the Friday, the the Saturday, or the Sunday, um, and it was out for t- for one dollar drinks afterwards. You know, that, that's what you did. You yeah. know, everyone's out um, on the drink, so that was that was kind of normalised for us, um, and it wasn't until. You know, 
uh, I'd say sort of Mark Graham came in and started introducing a little bit of um, sports science or philosophy behind performance, um, and he was probably a little bit ahead of his time for, for our Warriors group at that stage. I'd say there'd be a certain section of our audience, and I'm definitely included in this, that would know you as Warriors legend, Owen Gutenberg, 170 games, um, one of the all-time greats of the club. But perhaps they don't know how difficult those early years were um, and the injuries involved. And sort of in researching this episode, like we talked about the, the dealing with adversity when you were younger, but this like three, four, five-year period was hell. You had this... <laughs> incredible body you were built to be this amazing professional rugby league player and then it kept breaking down on you can you take us to the start of your your battle with injuries yeah yeah um so yeah it would have been 96 was my first year back here at the warriors and and um yeah my, my goal was always to make the kiwis and and as a kid i guess when i was when i was that sick kid in hospital that was that was my goal you know, to, to, to play for the kiwis so that was that was always number one for me and and um yeah, ninety six was was a was a good year. Um, played um, a fair bit of first grade, a bit of reserve grade, um, and Frank Endicott was a coach of the reserve grade side at the Warriors, and also he was the Kiwis coach. Um, so playing you know, well enough, and and I remember our um, first grade season finished, and the reserve grade team was still playing, and they were they were, they were in the finals. So um, I hadn't played. Um, too many games of first grade not to qualify to, to drop down and play reserve grade and help help the side out. And, and I remember having a conversation with me that um, it would be really good for me to, to play reserve grade to get keep up with my match fitness, fitness so that I'd be playing for the Kiwis. Um, so I was like, oh, hell yeah, um, I'll, I'll jump on board with that. Um, and then we played a, a game over at the Sydney Football Stadium, um, a reserve grade semi-final and, and I remember um, yeah, going into a tackle and, and turning an awkward way and, and um, yeah, rupturing my um, my ACL, um, so, so doing my knee. Um, at that stage I'd, I'd, I'd be carrying a, a sort of a dodgy shoulder in, as well, so that was my season done. I had a knee reconstruction, at the same time I had a left shoulder reconstruction, um, so it was, a, it was a long time um, under the general anaesthetic. Um, and then uh, went back and I had a hernia as well, sports hernia. So uh, that was 96. Um, had those and then sort of... Hell of a year. Yeah, hell of a year. <laughs> um, and then that, because it happened um, later in the season, I sort of missed the start of the, of the next year, um, worked my way back. And then it was uh, my right shoulder I did and busted that. Um, so I had surgery on that, reconstruction, another at least six months out. Um, and then, yeah, things yeah, just kept, kept happening and... and Back in those days, you had unlimited interchange. So you would had, I think it might have been six on the bench or something, and or four, I'm not sure. And you just rotate players through. So um, sort of worked out in the first five years of my first grade career, I'd spent more time under general anaesthetic than I did on the footy field. No way. Yeah, so really? Just, yeah, it would have been 50 or 60 hours uh, under under general anaesthetic. No, it was yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, yeah, had um, two re shoulder reconstructions, two... Um, Hernia is repaired, knee reconstruction, another sort of six or seven surgeries on the same knee. Had surgery on my ankles, broke my leg, um, snapped a major tendon under my foot, which is the equivalent of doing your Achilles. Um, broken thumb. Um, yeah, there, there was a whole lot. Man, that's insane. Like, I, I really want to dig in here because this is um, central to the success you've had in your life, and we'll get to business and post-career later. But that mindset that you had dealing with rheumatic fever, and then you've had all of these injuries, and most people that would be enough, one or two of them would be enough to derail a person and they wouldn't continue. But you've gone on to have this amazing career afterwards. So you're a man now when these things are happening. Do you remember in those moments how you – did you have a plan for getting through everything? Or? Um, probably not. Um, my goal was always to make the Kiwis, and, and uh, all I kept thinking was if I can't get, the, get it this way, there's another way, you know, and, and I just had to, I guess, I probably um, matured a lot more um, when we had Daniel Anderson first come into, into the Warriors environment. So prior to that, um, the expectation was you had to out-train everyone else that was fit to be able to be picked. You know, so I'd, I'd be pushing my body in a way that it probably wasn't able to be um, pushed because of the injuries that mm. I was suffering. So, so I was always um, sort of felt like I was behind the eight ball. Um, and then it wasn't until Daniel sort of come in and, and basically said, I don't care what you do during the week, 
you can give me 80 minutes of footy. Um, I don't care how you get there. You deliver on the footy field. Um, that's all that counts for me. So from there, I sort of evaluated where I felt I could give um, my best contribution to the to the team environment and what did we need, you know, and sort of step back. Instead of being the, um, the, the sort of floating back row that played on the edge that was, a, um, um, I guess, the guy that, that scored all the tries or, or set up all the tries, I was, I was sort of reframed to how can I be the guy that everyone wanted to play alongside. You know? Wow. Two, two points there. One, setback after setback after setback. Did you ever come close to packing it in? And the other one is like how much were you valued by this team that – you have a, you've been spending more time under anaesthetic than on the field, but they continue to believe in you. And was th- was it just the contract was long enough that, like, did they re-sign you when you were injured? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, timings also. Um, yeah, I've been blessed um, to come through at, at, at have the right doors open for me at the right time. Um, you know, a, a great example is, is my younger brother is far more talented than I am, um, and he. You know, his injuries um, probably come at, at times where the opportunities weren't abundant, you know, and, and for me, um, yeah, I remember sort of working my way back from the, from the major injuries, uh, my shoulders and my knee and, and a few other surgeries, and made round one, I can't remember if it was 98. Is this the North Sydney game? Um, no, it wasn't North Sydney. It was, um, we, played, we played over at the Sydney Football Stadium against the, the Roosters. Might have been round two. I, I, I can't remember, but um, and I played a really good game um, that preseason. I I trained with the team, and then I go do my own training afterwards. Um, and I was just one hundred percent focused to, on being the best that I could be, um, and played a really really great game. And um, Tyner we had taken over the club then, and Graham Lowe, who um, obviously I had a relationship prior signing me up to Super League, um, was was sort of in charge of of the Warriors football sort of environment. Um, and on the back of that game, he um, extended my contract um, for a, for another two or three years at at money that I probably didn't didn't necessarily um, deserve given given the amount of challenges that I'd been through. Um, so yeah, so so that was extremely fortunate. That was sort of a a bit of a safety net for me to get through the next few years. Um, until um, the club went under. I was going to say, like, not only, <laughs> not only have you got these injuries, the club at that stage is going through a f- tumultuous yeah, time man. off the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the club went under in 2000. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it was, that was a hard case, actually. So the, the club folds. You know, we're all owed two months' worth of salary. They pay you at the end of each month. So that money's gone. And all the boys, particularly Logan Swan, the tightest man in rugby league, um, <laughs> pulling up in trailers, loading up all the training equipment into the into the cars Amazing. because we knew that uh, the next day all the doors were going to be shut. So, so the gym was was so sparse um, when we started preseason in, in two thousand and one, um, and Daniel Anderson um, comes along. They got Ridgie involved to sort of broker deals with the players, and you know the the, the contract I signed at that time, I'd, I'd sort of. Yeah, um, the, the the free ride had gone, and it was it was basically living wage to get by, you know. Um, but I backed myself again. I had I still hadn't played for the Kiwis, and I'm like, I'm gonna get there, man. I, I don't care what it takes. And um, yeah, I, I remember the first training that that Daniel Anderson turned up. There, there might have been half a dozen of us and two footy balls. I remember him getting us um, to to dummy half pass off the ground in in our in our changing rooms to hit a cone. Just so he could understand what sort of skill that he, he was dealing with, you know, he had no idea about most of us. He he, he hadn't seen much um, of some of us play, um, particularly myself because I was injured for so long, um, and and that was kind of how he he um, he built the team. Did did he introduce an amnesty period where okay guys, if you've taken anything from the gym, <laughs> this twenty four hour period, no questions asked, just return it. <laughs> Would be like oh, that was all gone, man. I don't think trade me was around. There was buy, sell, and exchange, man. <laughs> Unbelievable scenes. But that must be a crazy time as well for you to to have to overcome the injuries, but then also to stick with the club throughout this. Like, you, what was it about the club itself? I know you've got the Kiwis dream, but what was it about the club that kept you coming back? To well, I think I'd, at that stage um, I had no other option. You know, I'd been um, busted so much and, and so many injuries that that. I wasn't that attractive to anyone else, you know. Um, at times, I wasn't attractive to to the Warriors environment. I remember um, them getting me to work in the reception and doing all those these sorts of things to justify them paying me 
my wage, you know, because um, wow. obviously there was some financial troubles with with the owners um, at the time, and and um, yeah, so I was in there trying to trying to, <laughs> trying to do what I could, make coffees and and things like that, because I couldn't be out there training, and they'd send me on all these promotional trips and do a whole lot of stuff that involved a lot of drinking and 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 partying, and I'm like, I don't want to do that, man. I want to get my body right. They're like, actually, the best thing you can do for us. Is go out there, kiss some babies, shake some hands, and make people happy. <laughs> <laughs> Did you view that as as also skill building for a, a career post playing? Or yeah, I probably uh, I didn't at, the, at that time, but but um, it definitely was uh, understanding relationships and um, yeah, and connecting with people. Absolutely. Are you proud? Looking back, are you proud of the way that you got through all that ad- adversity? Like that's a shitload of stuff that you pulled yourself through. To get out the other side. Like looking back, reflecting now, just talking about it, like how do you feel about getting through it? Yeah, uh, it's just it's just my journey. You know, I don't, I don't really look back and go, "Well, that was awesome." I'm just like, "How else was it supposed to play out?" Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, so Eric Watson comes in, and then I've heard stories about um, sort of match payments and you know the win the bonus, win bonus. Win bonuses. Yeah. and is that like <laughs> is that real camaraderie building like when everyone's on that together and yeah. you, you does that sort of bring a bit of spirit to the team yeah it was really interesting because it was the first time as i said um they, they were chucking money at, at us that were pretty pretty low balling you know and and they can you make, can you ballpark what a low ball rugby league offer is uh at that stage it was like 60 grand right you know um and you, you're, you're training every day, you're, you're, you're traveling all the time. Um, and to top it up, it was incentivized. So you win, you get, get some more, you make five games, 10 games, 20 games in the year, you get more, you make the New Zealand side, you get more. Um, and it was a really interesting, interesting dynamic because I'd never been a part of anything like it before where it brought out some, some real competition for, for spots in the side or something we hadn't had at the Warriors prior. Um, and then it also... It could have gone really bad, but but it, mm. it went really well for us. You know, we had a lot of young guys that, that were trying to prove themselves, and I think that meant that they were on an even par with a lot of other guys that had been around the environment for a period of time. Um, so yeah, so making the side, you, you'd have to earn your place, um, and then and then winning um, felt like you were you were directly rewarded for your efforts. So you wanted to be in the team number one, and you're going to bust your ass at, to to make sure you could do everything you could. Um, to get that win and, and, and balancing the, the contribution to the team versus the individual being the star, um, that was, that was I guess, um, Daniel Anderson's biggest challenge at that time. And, and were you one of the heads in the dressing room that helped manage the playing roster as well on Daniel's behalf? Um, not, not that first year. I was, I was just um, trying to earn my spot on the side, you know, um, coming back from injury. But, but there was definitely um, assistance that he would have had. You know, Stacey was, was there for a long time. Um, Ivan Cleary was involved. You know, we got um, Kevin Campion back. Um, and so, so there were players in there that, that um, definitely helped steer who, who was a part of the side. But um, I think it was bigger that you, you wanted to be picked for the side, but you also wanted the respect from, from your teammates. Um, for me, the, the, the later years of my career, I'd, I'd train with the team maybe once in the week. Um, that's the captain's run. And the rest of it I'd train on my own. Um, but the guys, you know, I'd, I'd put in enough effort so that I could convince myself I was good enough um, to deliver on the field, but then also um, to try and justify my position in the team without having to do what everyone, everyone else was doing. Pretty much every uh, best fights of the NRL <laughs> compilation has the scrap with the Broncos, uh, where Monty Beatham gets picked up and gets driven back. And then it's just everyone's in there and you're in there and, and it's just hell for leather. Uh, when you reflect on those fights and there's good and bad, obviously fighting is looked at differently now, but the camaraderie of sticking up for each other and like if one's going down, we're all going down. Like, How do you reflect on, on that now? Yeah, that was, um, that was a really, uh, obviously the violence part of it um, has, has changed in the game now, but um, it was, yeah, it was... It was awesome, and that, that was really the feeling that we had in, in that camp you know, or, or for those um, two or three years that um, we'd worked hard and we had each other's back. You know, you, you could trust that someone was going to be there for you if you needed them. Um, and, yeah, it was, you know, playing against the Broncos particularly. We'd, we'd never beaten the Broncos um, at home or ever, I think, until we, whether it was 2001 or two. Um, so, th- so that was kind of the, the biggest chip we had to get off our shoulders. You know, that was the monkey on our backs that we wanted to get 
head off our shoulders. So um, we look forward to that opportunity to to try and um, intimidate them. You know, that's what they used to do. They used to intimidate you. So we didn't necessarily have the biggest um, pack, but we we played um, really physical and and uh, yeah, I, th- I think there was a stat at, at the time you know for a couple of years that. After a team played the Warriors, they're most likely to lose the following week because yeah, because of the yeah. physicality. Yeah, and, and oh, is that stuff spoken about? Like the the fighting, is it just like an unspoken thing that if anyone starts something, we're all in, or is it like you need to back each other up out there? I think it was a. It's just it's just the feeling, you know. Um, words are easy, and, and I love. Um, watching any melee now, and everyone's running in. You get all the little wingers coming in, with chins <laughs> up, and yeah, yeah, pull and pull and uh, tug each other. Um, but yeah, I, I remember another thing Daniel Daniel Anderson said to to our front rowers um, was, if you're not suspended at least once in a year, you're not doing your job. You know, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that's wow, that's cool. That's, you know, that's cool. We, we want to play with um, aggression, physicality, and that's part of the job. You know. Well, there's a line, isn't it? And you've got to go as close to that line as, as possible. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, th- there was, you know, the teams that succeeded around that sort of um, late 90s, early 2000s were intimidating sides. You know, they were big, they were physical, they were powerful. Um, and you wanted to strike a bit of fear, uh, particularly for us, having teams come to, to Mount Smart, to our home ground, we wanted to, to make sure we made it uncomfortable for them. I'm really curious about, the notion of like having to flip a switch to get into that red mist mindset before a game is it is it as rudimentary as that kind of concept of okay boots on jersey on i'm fuck i'm in now and the rest of the time you're relaxed or are you high tension a lot of the time during the season uh no i think um it's different for different people um and yeah i, I mean for me i i yeah worked out that the only way that i could um be confident that I could deliver the best I could was was to um, do extra training over and above anyone else. Um, because I wasn't out there on the on the footy field with them, I'd be just trying to do extra stuff. Whether it was finish a game and do another forty minutes on the on the on the bike to to get a bit more fitness to to train my mind and condition my mind that next week I'm going to be even better. Um, so that that was it for me. So going out there, I knew that no matter what my opposition was doing, I was going to be more prepared than they were, um, but for some others it, it, may, it may have been the. You know, they talk about running over that 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 chalk and that line. Um, some are just really high strung all the time. Um, others are out there having a bit of fun. I, I remember um, with Daniel Anderson. So so we're in the changing rooms and and he's waiting to get the whole team together to give a team talk and pull everyone in. And uh, Clinton Torpy, um, Francis Mele, uh, Shantaine Happe, they're all. Uh, AWOL and can't find them and we're like where the hell are these boys and you could hear this like, what the hell is that and the boys are in there with um, with coloured uh, texters colouring in their boots <laughs> before we run out on the footy field because they wanted to be the fanciest and that's what back uh, when when all the try celebrations were in and all that sort of stuff they're getting their hair braided and was that Farfili was cutting the coconut cut, cutting the coconut yeah. you know so um, yeah, hard case. So those guys n- never, never approach the game like that. You know, they're just out there to have fun. But um, you knew that they had had uh, had your back if if you needed it. Because it's an interesting cast of characters inside that dressing room, right? You've got a mix of people, super religious backgrounds, a lot of Pacific Island and Maori influence in there. You had Kevin Campion, the hard nosed Aussie, like a kind of a like a motley crew is kind of a disrespectful way of describing it. But to have that blend across that team and perform, like it's personified with a try. The over the pa- over the head pass and it's against the Bronx again as yeah, well I yeah, think as good. well like it was just an amazing time to be a Warriors fan yeah yeah it was it was um, we felt that we were really skillful and, th- and that was one uh, well the great thing that Daniel Anderson um, brought to the club was was the fundamentals and I think we'd probably lost that or hadn't been taught that you know for for many years um, as as Kiwi rugby league players growing up in New Zealand so. Um, just instilling that confidence, and we're always playing um, conditioning games at training, and, and so you're, you're matching up against each other, and you're um, you're throwing the ball around, and it's um, you know if you, if you can trust your defense to get you out of trouble, then you enjoy the game because you can you can attack any any style of footy you want to. I like to draw comparisons <coughs> between my very limited amateur <laughs> uh, football experiences and elite athletes that we have on the show. But every successful team I've been in had an amazing off-field culture, and that meant 
piss trips basically from Hamilton to Auckland or everyone would party together and it just brought everyone together. I know that you were in charge of um, end of year team events and that obviously was important to you. Do you think that was central to the team's success when you reached those heights? Um, I, I don't necessarily know if it was if it was the, the, the end of year team trip um, because we had yeah, it was an interesting, really interesting mix. Um, you had guys, you know, the, the younger Polynesian boys wouldn't come to the after functions for about an hour or hour and a half because they'd sit in their car drinking their beers in the car and then they'd come in for the photos and then they'd be gone, you know. Um, so, Isn't yeah. that an amazing trait of Pacific Island yeah, man, culture? Yeah, crazy, eh? <laughs> Like Sol- Solomon Island's background, yeah. go to independent celebrations. It's the same thing. Yeah, man. Everyone's in the car drinking booze and not being inside at the function. It's <laughs> yeah. so weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, crazy, crazy. Um, but yeah, the, the end of year function, and then just trying to come up with with ways to connect the boys um, or the or the or the club in a way that respected and appreciate everyone's individuality. Um, that that was always a challenge, and um, I enjoyed that sort of stuff. Trying to trying to understand how to bring a group of people together um, from different backgrounds, different beliefs, um, different levels of commitment, and and make it work. I'd heard one story that these sort of the kiddies for the end of year trips um, sort of grew throughout the season and there's one year that it was particularly big and you couldn't travel for some reason and it ended up being like 100k worth of kitty <laughs> and you had to go to like Bay of Islands or yeah, something. Yeah man, yeah. So, but, this, <laughs> so this is when um, yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Eric Watson comes in and you know, we're, we're all on these incentivized sort of sort of payments and stuff and that was each individual and I remember we win, won the first game and Eric comes in and goes, all right, we're going to put every every win, we're going to put 10 grand into the team fund. We're like, hell yeah, go the wow. bonus. Um, we won <laughs> wow. sort of three games and we're up to 30 grand or 40, you know, might have been four, 40 grand. Um, and then Nicky Watson mentioned something to the press. And of course, we, we've got salary cap conditions, so we can't can't do that, you know. So he's like, all right, so here's what happened. We can't we can't give you the money right now. Or we, can't, we, can't, we can't keep uh, building it up. But if you make the top eight, I'll give you a hundred grand plus the forty you already have, so there's a hundred and forty grand. We're like, oh shit, yeah. <laughs> and 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 we we ended up making the top eight for the first time in two thousand and uh, and one. And then uh, we planned for a trip to go uh, overseas, and then nine eleven happened. Oh. And we're like, shit, we don't want to go anywhere that's oh. too far abroad. And then we looked at booking um, Bali. We had Bali flights ready, and then Ansett was the airline, and it went under. So, so we're like, oh man, we've got like two weeks to turn this around. Where are we going to go? We're like, guess where we go? Bay of Islands. $140,000 to spend, baby. Wow. That is a big right. injection. All right. into I'm, I'm going to dig in on details here. Are you the one? Are you driving? Have you got that? Like, is there like a leadership group? With, what, are, what are we going to do with 140K in Bay of Islands? Yeah, like, oh, there, was, there was some ideas chucked in there. And it, it was, I mean, we helicoptered everywhere. We helicoptered to <laughs> Waitomo <laughs> Caves first and then and then up to Vineyards and then across here. And the boys' room service having crayfish for breakfast, lunch and dinner and ringing home back in Samoa and stuff nonstop. It was, we didn't spend all the money. I think we got through maybe 70 grand or 80 grand of it. Um, but decent, it, that's a decent effort. A decent effort, man, up there. Yeah, hell yeah. That was good. Imagine it might be the first end of year trip I've ever heard about where they didn't spend the yeah, whole money. Yeah, didn't, didn't spend it all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, the, good. and the following year, watershed moment, grand final. Yeah, man. Was that the peak of your playing career? I think it was. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it I don't know if it was. I think it was probably the most enjoyable environment, um, 2002 and 2003. Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty wild ride. You know, we, we ended up becoming minor premiers um, on the back of the Bulldogs um, fudging the salary cap. So, right. so they got deducted a whole lot of points. And um, heading into the last game of the year, um, we're playing the Tigers at home. And, um, you know, Daniel rested maybe six or seven of us that, that were playing regular first grade um, just to protect us for the finals. And... We needed someone else to win by a certain margin and we had to win or something. And, and it ended up coming off that, that our team that we put out there won the game against against the Tigers. And it might have been, I don't know, it might have been Newcastle had to beat somebody by an X number of points. Uh, and they did that and then we became minor premiers. So it was, uh, it was, it was uh, yeah, pretty amazing for us as, as a club to, to get that. And um, going into that final series was, was pretty amazing going to, you know, um, play footy at that level. Um, I guess I, th- there's a couple of reflections that I have on that. Like I'd never been to a grand final before, so I didn't understand the gravity of it 
and uh, I guess how important it was. Uh, conceptually, coming from New Zealand, you're like, yeah, win a grand final, that's all cool. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Let's go to the grand final and stuff. But yeah, after going to them many times afterwards as a, as a spectator, um, sitting there and in absorbing what it is, I'm like, ah, now I get it. Now I get it. I only wish I'd been to one bef- before, you know, and, and kind of understood the stage and the significance um, because it's all sort of conceptual at, at that stage. You know, we hadn't had a lot of success. Um, and leading into that year, you know, we sort of set ourselves a goal. We'd, we'd made the top eight prior to that, and then it was make the grand final. You know, and, and you know, for me, it, it, I felt like we set our sights one game too short. You know, so we made the grand final. We achieved what we wanted. Um, I'm sure there's other other members of the team that, that may th- think a little bit different, but for me, that's it's kind of um, one of the one of the regrets that, that I think I have as a as an environment that we didn't set it to win the grand final. Because you, you do talk about that grand final, that sense of occasion. Because as a as a league fan, you hear about the grand final breakfast and the footy show has a, a lead into it. Like, is, is that all? Are you swept up by the hype of of the lead in that week leading into the to yeah the, to the yeah I, I think so you know I, I definitely think so and, and there used to be a saying that you got to lose one to win one um, yeah I, I don't think that's the case but um, understanding what it is um, certainly would frame it correctly and I know that we've had coaches um, in the past that used to sit us down and watch us or make us watch some pretty significant league matches um, of of the past era um, but I don't. I don't appreciate. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I didn't appreciate what the lesson was at that time. You know, I thought, oh, we're just going to watch some old game. You know, not understanding. Um, looking back now, I'm like, shit. I wish I had paid attention to that. You know, mm. I wish leading into that game, I would have watched the um, the first time that the Newcastle, uh, sorry, the Melbourne Storm won, uh, and Tawara Nikau's performance in that second half sort of changed the game. You know, I wish I had watched that and modelled my um, my level of of success for that game of of what he did. Wow. Yeah. I'm fascinated in team dynamics and you were involved in some of the most successful Warriors teams of all time. But then in 2004, they kind of fell off the cliff with essentially that same group of players, Fifteen finished 15th out of 16 with 18 losses. I'm sure you probably get asked about this a lot, but do you pinpoint a reason why it was so high one year and so low the next? Yeah, I think um, at the time probably probably didn't quite understand. Um, I, I think from a from a from a leadership perspective um, at the club that that they probably lost sight of of who we were and, and what we were th- there for. Um, at the time, um, that they were looking at a Super Rugby franchise. Um, we had um, conversations myself, Stacey, and Monty about um, moving over to. Um, over to London and being part of um, them taking over the London Broncos and us having an equity share in, in, the, in the footy club. Um, there was a whole lot of other stuff, you know, that they got into boxing and there was a whole lot of other events that, that, um, you know, that, that they were looking at. And I think we probably, um, well, the, the management and the ownership probably looked a little bit too broad in, in terms of what they were trying to achieve. And, and that may have um, meant that there was a little bit of, um, yeah, confusion um, down the ranks in terms of the coaching and the stability of the coaching. Um, you know, we had other people wanting to be uh, promoted in, in terms of that, that, that coaching environment and, and it probably th- there was a lot of undermining being done and that, that continued for a couple of years. Yeah, there's lessons to be learned there, right? Like it's so unusual for it to go from the very top to the very bottom. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. What, what, other lessons, what are other lessons out of that that you, that you maybe have taken away outside of sport that you can implement in your kind of post career yeah uh, you know the fish always rots from the head you know and 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 it's trying to make sure that um yeah you stay focused on on what you're there to do and and um you know i'm always looking at different strategies and different ways of, of approaching a situation and making sure that the people um surrounding me or under me or or um you know giving me um advice or direction feel safe and they feel trust and and that um yeah they've got a pillar to to um, make sure that they can always come back to if, if things go wrong um one of the other things with the, that 2004 season so um penrith panthers uh they they won the 2003 grand final and they're a big side you know so so um i think in in the game Whatever sides wins, or whatever side wins, everyone else tries to emulate what they did the year before. So, um, yeah, the Roosters were up and in 
uh, defence on the outside. You, you look at Melbourne Storm, the wrestle. And so everyone tries to emulate that. And um, I think we, or Daniel Anderson, had, a, had an approach that we all needed to be bigger um, to play that 2004 season. So we had, a, we had um, guys would stand on the scales. And if you're overweight, you're in the fat club. If you're underweight, you're in the skinny club. So we had guys like Mark Tukey in the fat club, and they'd be in the, in the gym changing room on the extra cycle bikes at 6 a.m. And us skinny guys that weren't carrying enough body fat would be in the gym at 6 a.m. eating uh, bacon and egg um, sandwiches from, on the barbie, you know, so wow. in front of them. And, and there's, this, there's this real contradiction, man, of, of being a, a sports side, you know, a, a professional environment. So, yeah, we just had to bulk up, and it, and it wasn't necessarily um, – bulking up in the best way you know it was just put on weight man put on weight that's how we're going to win we're going to win and, and we did everything really well like we'd all put on a whole lot of weight um we didn't do much running that pre-season it was all in the in the swimming pool or on the exercise cycle bikes very very limited running um and we had gps's just come out then tracking our distances and all that sort of stuff so the science around that was you know, it was sound it was going to get us there um and i remember the pre-season you know we sort of excused some of our performances because we weren't necessarily there to win we were there to build up to our first game against um against it was the Brisbane Broncos over in Brisbane and I remember running out there first 10 minutes um Brisbane score a try and then we all go back to the the try line and I remember thinking oh shit we don't fucked up here man because <laughs> we're, we're, we're in trouble <laughs> we're, we're, we were just all blowing and we just had nothing in the tank man and and that was I guess yeah it wasn't a wasn't a good ingredient to put into the recipe of, of a little bit of lost focus from from the leadership um, of the of the club and yeah and the direction that we took in terms of um, our, our footy and, and what we were actually really fundamentally good at and we tried to change that. What was the biggest you got to weight wise? Like what was the range? What was your, your um, min weight and max weight? Yeah, so so probably 101 was was my playing weight. 101 sort of um, after a game, you know, you'd be down to 90, 98 or something. Um, and then that preseason, I was, I was uh, 106 and a half, I think. Um, yeah, Fucking yeah. Thing. So yeah. carrying a fair bit, bit more weight. And yeah. how how'd you fare in the in the weight room on on the bench? You, uh, one of the bigger guys. I was I was actually really good because I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> 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 I couldn't run, man. So I had the record for a fair 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 amount of time until. What, um, what was it? Uh, I think it was 167.5. Three times, yeah. yeah. Three times, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. That was that, that was. Is that recorded up on the gym wall? No, nah, well, then you had Brent Webb come in, um, who who weighed eighty kilos and 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 beat that, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, Webby. We had Mark Ellison. What did he say? One fifty. One fifty. He maxed out at one rep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, it was yeah interesting. I guess we're getting close to leaving rugby league, but before we do, I, I wanted to touch on your international career because it's an incredible arc and an homage to both sides of your family, where you were able to represent Tonga in nineteen ninety five then achieve your goal of representing the Kiwis in, in 2002, I think was your first appearance. And then Swan Song was 2008 with Tonga again. How special is that to be able to honour those two sides of your family with that international career? Yeah, it was it was really special. Um, yeah, my grandfather um, uh, was from Tonga. My dad's born in Tonga. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really nice. Um, as I mentioned, growing up and all my uncles had played um, footy and, and told all those stories uh, uh, my grandfather father had passed away as well, so so it was a real tribute to to him, and and I was fortunate enough that that I got put into the squad, you know, as a as a nineteen year old. Um, this was when I signed with Super League, so I wasn't playing much footy uh, on the on the yeah, bench. The for, flowing locks as well on the bench for reserve grade. Yeah, the flowing locks. Oh man, a hard case, hard case. But it was really cool. Had had some um, really amazing players there, um, and it was a real eye opener to to um, international footy and and. It was the first time I'd, I'd really um, been surrounded by my Tongan culture, so so that was yeah, you know, it was really 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 special. Um, yeah, it was awesome. And then I guess to finish up my footy career, um, playing in another World Cup for Tonga was was a nice um, way to to give back to to the nation and and um, yeah, to stay connected from that perspective. Take us back to that '95 experience because had you had you kind of mentioned there that was your first time really interacting with the culture was it an intimidating thing for you or did you instantly feel at home once you were in that group um no it was it was intimidating um but you know there, there was some uh, solomon Hamono was with me at manly and and um so you know he sort of held my hand through the through the process he was my roomie um you know we were really good mates at manly and, and then john hopawati and his mother uh, Mele, they they over saw a house so when i went to manly there was about eight or nine of us um, went over a similar age and I was the only one that didn't go and stay in the house with the with the Hopawatis. Um I went and, and stayed with another family so um, always spent a lot of time with them so 
um, yeah, it was it was intimidating, but it but it felt right, you know. And, and sometimes you, you go, ah, this is what's been missing, you know. And it, it was it was really nice. It was really nice. And did you play in that '95 game against the Kiwis? Yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talk because yeah. I that's a vivid. That's burnt into my memory. I know, man. I know we were so close to beating them, you know. And and um, yeah, they they called the tackle count incorrectly, and I think we kicked the ball, rushed, and and then Reggie slots um, you know, slots a couple of goals and a drop kick, and, and they end up winning by one point. But yeah, it was yeah, it was interesting, you know. And, and that was Stacey's first Test match, my first Test match, and we played against each other. I remember him um, trying to run around me, and I managed just to get him, um, and he played the ball, and then I pulled his pants down. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, for those that don't know, Tonga, you Tonga were leading twenty four twelve. Yeah, man. With a few minutes to go. Yeah, yeah. It would, it would have been like uh, eight minutes to go. Yeah. And tempting fate, but celebrations almost. On yeah, the sideline yeah. We're it. celebrating too soon, you know. Um, yeah, the, the sideline watching them <laughs> were just like, Shit. oh no, <laughs> it's happening. here they go, <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah, and, and yeah. Oh man, yeah. It would have been. It would have been. Uh, would have been awesome. But then to see the the way that the. Um, you know the, the the Tongan rugby league players and, and the Samoan rugby league, rugby league players are now getting behind, um, you know their 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 heritage and and representing their sides um, in international footy is 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 pretty amazing. Because that's the point that I wanted to get to is that you're almost a trailblazer in that regard of of being someone that represented New Zealand, and then decided actually I'm going to go and honour honour my heritage and represent Tonga, which. Tom Alolo famously did that again and, and almost became the first in that 2013 Rugby League World Cup. That's an, an amazing kind of turnaround in philosophy too. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, it's great for the game too. You know, you, it takes um, yeah, someone like him that's extremely brave at the height of his career um, to step up and make a statement and, you know, everyone else that, that followed, you know, I, I think uh, would certainly thank him for it. I'm going to take us uh, away from league now because a lot of athletes, when they achieve their success, you have struggle post-career um transitioning into whatever whatever comes next but it seems like you have done it right um and i'll get to business soon but first of all was it punditry pretty soon afterwards like did you start transitioning into punditry uh you know towards the end of your career and for anyone who's with us i mean you'll know how much of an eloquent eloquent speaker you are did, did that appeal as a long-term like career path I, th I think I was fortunate that um, I was doing bits and pieces while I was playing. Um, you know, I was a reliable, I guess, um, person that answered the phone to go in and, and sort of sit in on games and, and give um, updates on the team and things. I think I was doing something for, for Sky Sport um, within the, the, the Warriors environment. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel extremely fortunate that my pathway and my landing post-footy was, was a lot softer than most um, because I was, I was able to, to still earn money um, I was still in the in the rugby league environment, and I still had that connection, but but just from a different perspective. So that still fulfilled, I guess, a need that I had, um, and and gave me a bit of a safety blanket to to explore life after footy. And I know so many don't get that same opportunity. So yeah, it was cool. It was, it was good, and and um, I sort of got uh, might have been four, five, six, seven years into it, and and it wasn't fulfilling me anymore. You know, being in that. In that sort of environment, I, I just felt like I was I was boxing myself in because I'd been doing footy for so so many years, and I knew that there's there was something else out there for me that that um, yeah that scared me, and and um, yeah I, I thought I had I felt I had no other option but to jump at something that scared me again and deal with the consequences after. So so yeah, you know, I walked away from from sort of working for Sky and, and do very little um, sort of radio or TV stuff anymore. Just on the punditry before we move, move to business, how hard, I mean, good pundits have opinions and they uh, say what they feel. How hard was it critiquing guys that you had played with only a few seasons earlier? Yeah, I, I don't, um, I never tried to go down that path because I understood, um, number one, I understood what the players go through and they're not out there trying to, to fail and, and um, yeah, not succeed. And number two, I felt I had a duty of care to the game not to do that. You know, um, I wanted more people watching the game, supporting the game. Um, there, there may have been the odd time that, that you can't help but be critical, but um, yeah, and, and maybe that was it for me that, that I couldn't necessarily um, be honest, and, and I felt almost um, yeah, like like it was it was pre-scripted that you you had to do certain things a certain way, you know, and, and um, 
yeah, that's that's kind of not how, not how I roll. But yeah, the, the transition was um, an interesting one too because um, it's basically ready, set, here's a mic, and away you go, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, there was right. there was no there was no support, you know, and and um, yeah, say yeah. some words, say some stuff. What do <laughs> yeah, you take? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like here you go. You're, you're live. I'm just like shit, man. Yeah, and and I understand that it's. Probably um, for some people, it's seeing people that have played the game come in. Um, there's a threat to them uh, in terms of them being the the, the star of the ho uh, the show or keeping their job for a long time. So, you know, that's that's not the game I played. You know, mm. um, we'll, we'll make our way to pacifier uh, at the end. But to to start the business journey, like you're obviously very switched on towards, or maybe even in the middle of your career towards the end. But there was uh, painting, telemarketing, sports tours, like. Uh, what's driving that? Are you just thinking, am I? How can I earn money, or are you thinking, what can I do to set myself up for for after career? I was kind of looking at, at has, how can I hustle um, <laughs> to get the best out of this <laughs> the situation, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Uh, well, is it hustle? Is it being a hustler's mentality your kind of life? I think so. You know, again, man, I'm on my own island, and, and I got to make shit happen. So, um, yeah, I've always sort of bought and renovate houses when I was when I was playing footy. Yeah, had a painting. Um, franchise, um, telemarketing company, um, had n no idea about any of it, lost lots of money um, you know, in the share market, doing doing a whole lot of different things. Um, yeah, and, and just trying to figure out what I liked, what worked, what didn't. Um, and, and when I was playing footy, you know, I'd be, I'd be trying to hustle and broker deals um, for myself, but then to get sponsorship to um, one of the spa pools. So, so I hustled the club to give some because we, you know, it was all in the salary cap and stuff, and you get tickets, and someone will look after you here and do all these sorts of things. So, yeah, I was, I was always always trying to come up with creative ways to get two parties the result they wanted. You know, um, yeah, I mean, a, a perfect example. I I had a testimonial um, uh, for the Warriors. And One of only two ever, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you and Stacey. Me and Stacey, yeah. That, that they've actually put on a testimonial um, sort of event for. Um, and, and the salary cap comes come sort of into question there, so um, the club can't be seen to support it. So you know, everyone's best mate, the Mad Butcher, sort of jumped in behind it. And I, I convinced um, the Puma were, were the sponsors of the club at the time. Um, and each year I understood that they could come up with a with a variation to the jersey um, that could be used. Um, so, so I went to them and, and the Warriors and sort of said, hey, look, my testimony is this year. Have you come up with something yet? Um, they said, no, we haven't actually. And I said, well, what about this for a concept? What about um, you give me the opportunity to, to put together a testimonial jersey for myself um, and then we can run this sort of event? And they were like, great idea, man, but um, we can't be seen to supplying to be su supplying any jerseys because if we're paying for it, we can't do it. I was like, okay, cool. Well, problem solved. I'll pay for all the jerseys. Um, so I think you had to put together 54 jerseys or something for, for – um, for the NRL club, um, so I did that. So I went and got um, somebody to design um, uh, a jersey based on my heritage. Um, Puma was on board. I paid for all the jerseys, and then at the at the um, charity auction, I came up with the idea that we um, everyone puts in a silent bid for the jerseys. We'll auction off the one that I wore um, to try and raise some funds, and, and um, yeah, it did really well, man. You know, it raised over a hundred grand from from, really? from those jerseys, you know, and and. Uh, um, yeah. It was just a, you know, I just came up with the idea, you know, I was just like, yeah. how can I hustle this and how can I make it work? Um, come, yeah, so it was, yeah, I was always trying to look at ways to, like I said, um, yeah, give people what they wanted um, without feeling like someone was taking advantage of them. I'm keen to dig in on the sports tour hustle. How long did that? <laughs> how long? How, how long did that last for? And what, what were some of the best best trips? Then are, oh, are you going to bring man. it back? Now? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I was again. doing I was doing stuff with um, Willamette Travel. You know, they'd they'd be taking people over to host and all that sort of stuff. And um, they asked me to host a couple of grand final tours. And I was just like, man, why don't I do this myself? You know. So um, I um, I think. I did one for Willamont and then Air New Zealand were doing some. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'll jump on Air New Zealand bandwagon um, for grab a seat. And then I made contacts there. And again, they, they were sort of looking at doing stuff um, but didn't have the resource to do it uh, in terms of the time to put these trips together. Um, so I would um, use them for the all the flights and, and they'd block off flights for us. Um, and then I'd try and find contacts that I knew, um, whether it was boxing world title fights, um, UFC, whether it was golfing, 
um, whether it was just shit that I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what do I really want to do? That's the best. And I want people to pay and we can have this amazing time. That's yeah. why we started this podcast. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was it. You know, uh, um, one, of, one of my whys is creating magic moments for people that may n- never have them otherwise. Um, and that was it. So trying to pull these things together and, and um, yeah, do some pretty amazing stuff. And, what was know, the best one that you pulled together? The one, the most memorable one? Um, yeah, the, I mean, that, it probably wasn't the one for punters but um we've got a group uh that we've been we're going for uh 20 years this year actually um friday the 13th um boys so 20 years ago there was a, there was a few of us my brothers and and sort of close mates um would have been about a dozen of us we're like how do we how do we con- convince our wives that or partners at the time that we can get on the piss for a whole day um and they're cool with it and we're like <laughs> yeah. all right let's let's pitch this every, every friday every man is now taking notes yeah. of this podcast <laughs> every title. friday the 13th um, we'll have a, uh, have a Friday the 13th club. And they were like, yeah, so it's sweet. There's only probably one a year or something. And, and most of the time there's two. Every now and then there's one or three. Um, so we've been doing it for 20 years. And and a lot of the guys um, hadn't traveled a lot. Um, so, yeah, we, we sort of, they were, they were fundraising for about th- three years. We're doing hangies and all that sort of stuff to put money together and stuff. And I planned this trip for us over to Las Vegas. I had 70 grand left over for that. <laughs> 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 So the pocket it. Team yeah, man. Just kick start, kick start. <laughs> so yeah, there was there was twenty, I think twenty four of us um, put a trip together. We went to Las Vegas for a week, and then up to Cancun for a week. Um, amazing. And just yeah, just created these these amazing moments for for uh, for our, a group of mates. Man, it was it was pretty cool. Aren't those just the best? Those time. Yeah, man. Twenty four yeah. mates going to Vegas. Like the I excitement know. about that I trip know. in the months building up. I can't imagine oh, the chat group. Oh, for sure, man. It was, it was like three years. Like I said, they, they were, we were doing hangies every two months. You know, so the boys yeah, could get money true. together and and building up to it. It was uh, yeah, that was our thirteenth year. So Friday the thirteenth in Las Vegas. Then we then we convinced our partners or wives at that time um, for most of us. Um, that we're going um, somewhere to cool down and, and relax and wind down. And we went to Cancun, <laughs> which, <laughs> which didn't work out too well. <laughs> it was great. But no, we come back broken. We've, we've got a, a similar um, theme in our friend group. It's the 12 pubs of Christmas. It's one day every year at the start of December. And it's just this group of mates. And we all go out and it's just a big blowout. And we never really do it anymore, but it's just one night a year. But it's in its fifth year. And mm. it, I love how it sort of evolves and gets a little bit bigger and a bit more in depth each time. It's got like a program and an agenda and there's games at each pub and all this sort of stuff. We haven't got to, to Vegas or overseas well, yet. Well, that's the, that's the extension, is yeah. the, the logical extension. If only we had someone in the know that was able to organize <laughs> some sort of a tour for us and come with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so so link us up. So you've had these hustles and you, you've tried bits and pieces uh, and, and then you've stumbled on what you're doing now. Like, yep. I'm not sure if there were more in between, but where did Pacifier come in and, and talk us through? Great name, by the way. Yeah. Very, very clever. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the industry, you know, Pacifier, so um, sort of, it's just names on the tin can, but, um, so when I, yeah, when I was doing the, the um, sort of commentary stuff um, and, I, and I wasn't feeling fulfilled, I knew there was something else out there for me. Um, I really, like, I wanted to be an architect at school. I love the construction stuff and I'd done some developments and, and subdivisions and I thought, oh, I want to jump into that and dive into it, but, I appreciated that if, if I wanted to, I wanted to do it in a big way, um, but I didn't have a construction background. <laughs> I didn't have a construction company. Um, didn't have a job to go to. You know? So um, a friend of mine was a QS on a on a job that um, the developer went went under, um, and I was talking to him about what I wanted to do. He he was um, saying, "Well, look, I can put you in front of the client, and if you can bullshit your way in front of the client, he'll give you the job. I'll back you up." I'm like, "Sweet." Put me into the meeting, so I called a, a mate of mine, um, Quincy, who had a construction company, come along to the meeting, and I, um, yeah, I, I bullshitted the, the the client that I had a construction company, we could do all this sort of stuff, do all that, and so he gave us the job, and and uh, it was a massive job for for my mate. Um, hang on, hang on, pause there. You, you're sort of <laughs> fluffing over this, like, but how much prep are you putting into that? Like, this is a big meeting, right? Yeah. Are you? Are you spending days thinking about what you're going to say and and planning how you're going to bullshit this guy, or is it sort of off the cuff? No, it's pretty much off the cuff. Yeah, yeah. I I, I kind of understood a bit about the background, what they wanted the result to be, and yeah, just said, asked him what his challenges were, said we'd fix them, and yeah, that was it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Came out of the meeting and went, fuck. Yeah, yeah, did. Now like, deliver. Oh shit, man, can we do this? It was like, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, so yeah so so we jumped into that and and um and and doing the doing the build there um 
yeah, there was this passive fire stuff that they asked us to do because the company that had done it before didn't do it um, well enough and the, the council wouldn't sign it off. So I sort of looked into it a bit more, had no idea what it was, um, saw that with um, labourers that we had, we might have been making 10 bucks an hour. Um, we could put the same labour into passive fire and make 50 bucks an hour from them, you know, and, and it was, I was like, okay, so that stacks up. Um, what else is behind this? Well, why Why is this an opportunity? And, and um yeah, it was sort of on the back of the leaky building stuff that, that we had um, and understood that, that in the building code there's there's a couple of clauses that talk to um, smoke and fire separations. Um, I'm, all learning, I'm learning this as I, as I was reading it at the time and, <laughs> and realised that the council weren't inspecting it correctly. So there was a massive liability on, on existing buildings um, and um, I knew that if we could get in front of the right people and convince them that that they should get a, a specialist passive fire company and as opposed to the individual trades to do their um, fire sealant, um, that that would be onto a winner. Um, and I guess through my um, sort of network and, and um, relationships, uh, I was a good friend of the, the owner of Dominion Construction, um, Brett Russell, and he sort of backed me to, to put me on some jobs and and, um, uh, and, and Andy Hall was, was sort of working there and he... They gave me an opportunity, and um, as long as we could deliver, um, they, they kept backing us. So, so most of our work was was on the Dominion jobs, and then slowly grew the team. And then, sort of Greenfield Tower um, incident happened over in the UK, mm. where, where the building caught on fire, and it and it sort of brought it front to mind of the front of mind of, of um, developers and and I guess the people doing the the builds that that it needed to be done. Prior to that, they were trying to think of it as as a cost that they were putting in there that they don't get any return for um but yeah, it's life safety you know so um yeah so so it's just sort of grown from there and and try to try to base the business off of um what i've learned in my sporting environment and, um and and being parts of successful and unsuccessful teams um and it you know it, it has its it, it's we've had our challenges if you get the wrong people into into seats on the bus that they don't belong in um but yeah, for most of it, it's um, it's been a pretty awesome ride. How, how often do you dip into your sporting experience and your business experience now? Is it like an everyday thing where you go, I've got this in my toolkit, I can pull that out from this experience? Yeah, yeah, it, it um, yeah. I mean, the skills are there. Um, they, they may be just, um, yeah, uh, they may be covered by um, a description that is a is a footy term versus a business term. You know? um, it was really interesting uh, doing some work with the Warriors guys um, many years ago, um, and and seeing um, the value that some of them had w- was solely tied around them as a football player and and the associated skills that they've learnt. Um, they didn't see that that could um, serve them extremely well after their footy careers, you know. And and I think that's one of the bridges to be ga- uh, so the, the gaps to be um, bridged by. Um, yeah, by encouraging them that, that they have these great assets that they've learned from their footy career, you know, um, being driven, being focused, being open to feedback, um, you know, making sure that you're there on time, you're delivering. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many attributes that, that lean towards um, being a fantastic person for business or, or to be hired into a company. What, what so, year? Steve, I'm going to have a coffee with <coughs> it. Oh, you're right, man. <laughs> Get it all out. Um, so, so what year is the business in now? Like, how big is the company? How, how many people? Uh, work for so, it? Yeah, so we. What did I start? I sort of had the idea maybe eight or nine years ago, and then started it seven years ago. Um, we got staff of forty-five, um, looking to bring in another ten at the moment. Um, so yeah, we're, we're in a we're in a good place. Um, we're slowly spreading um, through through New Zealand at the moment. Um, Prior to COVID, that was sort of our push was to was to go national, and it, um, yeah, obviously COVID um, stunted that. But yeah, at the moment we're working in in sort of several regional areas, and and um, yeah, by the end of end of the year, we're hoping to be um, in the South Island as well. So it's cool, man. Got a, got a fantastic team. Um, yeah, it's you know, one of those extremely rewarding things is is providing opportunities um, for people that might not otherwise have it. Um, uh, eight of our guys have got their residency visas from the Philippines and, and um, you know, just seeing some of the sacrifice that they've made to, to provide a better life for their families um, and, and to be able to be a part of that journey is, a journey is 
it was really humbling, man. Like you see, you know, they're, they're building houses that they didn't have prior. You know, they're able to put their kids through um, secondary school and tertiary school education, which helps take them out of poverty. You know, that this is this is real life stuff, man. And and um, you know, that's that's um, that's why I do it. You know, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's such a cool story, really? and and I love the 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 hustling background of the trying the different things, and you've found something, and it's been a great fit, and you've just succeeded at it. It's like you've done with everything in your career. I've got a section here, question uh, titled "Big Questions," and <laughs> I told Che before we started, I was like, "This this section's gonna pop." Yeah, yeah. Go. But we needed to sort of paint the um, the picture first, paint the landscape of, of all you've done, because I heard in an interview you said your biggest fear was not living up to your potential. So I wondered, have you lived up to your potential? Um, no, man. <laughs> no, there's, there's, still, uh, there's still a whole lot more to do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just one of those people that always see where you're at now as the stepping stone to something else. You know? um, and, and that's probably a, a safety mechanism for me as well, that, that um, yeah, that if things change, then that's cool. Um, I think change is is what um, helps me grow and and you know um, yeah chase things that scare me man. Stepping stone, like, are we talking about your your dream in, in ten years time? Is the business is twice as big, or is it more time with family or more time with friends? Like, what what is the perfect version of the next ten years for you? Yeah, I, I probably haven't looked that far ahead, other, other than um, knowing that um, my family is my number one priority. Um, and that's always hard when when I'm focused on trying to to create more and do more because that that um, fulfills a need that I have. Um, but yeah, I guess yeah, being surrounded by love, um, having a yeah, an environment that creates and breeds happiness. Um, you know, a lot of laughter, a lot of smiles, um, a lot of experiences, good and bad that that um, <coughs> made you feel supported um, in. Um, yeah, but uh, I guess I don't know where where the next ten years is going to take me, and that that you know I'm I'm typically somebody that likes real certainty. I, I want to know where where I'm going to be and, and what I want to do, and we've got to get here on time, and we've got to do all these sorts of things because it gives me certainty. Um, but when it comes to what the future looks like, I had no idea that I'd be doing passive buy, you know, yeah. and and. Yeah. Um, we're you know, working on technology at the moment, um, putting a lot of time into that and understanding um, what that looks like, um, and that excites me. That's something totally new where I'm where I'm learning a whole lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, the, the idea is to 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 build this um, this vehicle that provides for so many people opportunities, um, have an amazing team that can that can run with this, and you know I'm. Then who knows where where I'll be? Um, yeah, ten years time, but um, that excites me. Told you he was going to deliver. Yeah, he was. Hey. <laughs> and you you speak to support. We talk about ten years in the future, but I'm I'm interested in in your wife Natasha because she's been with you for a long period uh, yeah, of, yeah, of yeah. time along the journey. Can you speak to her importance in terms of your life and what she provides to you? Yeah. Oh man, she's um, she's my best friend. You know, and, and I think people say that all the time about their partners, but. Um, she she is you know um, I remember the first time we met um, we were going back and forth with um, delirious quotes Eddie Murphy I'm like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> red jumpsuit really, all right, really yeah. nice <laughs> all right uh, yeah all right you're right you're right, you're right. yeah and I always joke that um, yeah she used to used to stalk me and all this sort of stuff but it was it was the other way around man it was um, yeah pretty pretty uh, pretty amazing um, sort of journey we've had we've been married 21 years now um, together 22. Two beautiful, amazing children. Um, yeah, she. Uh, there's no coincidence that um, yeah, my sort of injury and and uh, um, I guess what I was striving for at that period of time um, seemed to dissipate when when I met Tash. You know, um, just just calm me a bit. I understood that I didn't have to be everything to everybody. Um, I had somebody that loved me and and unconditionally, and it was. Yeah, man, it was it was amazing, and we've had some amazing experiences. We've you know, moved over to England, lived there for a while. We love to travel. Um, you know, we love to open um, opportunities for for people that we love, and and um, yeah, our family first and foremost, and wider family and you know, friends and um, support network. 
Um, but yes, no, she is my sounding board. She's my thought partner. She's, um, yeah, she's somebody that um, I treasure um, dearly, man. And, and um, yeah, she gives me the right amount of um, freedom and space to be myself, but also um, the support and the, I guess the guidance to follow my dreams, if you know what I mean. That's really nice. Um, tough questions. Uh, t- tough questions on the spot, but uh, I love talking to dads about their dad journey. Um, you got two kids. What have you learned about yourself on your parenting journey? Yeah, man, this is, um, yeah, yeah, and really, yeah, really cool um, and really challenging sometimes because um, I guess when I was um, – doing the, the, the commentary broadcasting thing. Um, we'd only work on the weekends, you know, so weekdays my golf handicap was really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to your golf. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I was able to drop my daughter off at school, pick her up. I was, I was really heavily involved in her um, sort of early childhood and, and schooling. Um, and then with our son, I've, I've been busy with um, so, sort of creating this, this vehicle um, to, to provide for our family. And, and there's, there's a lot of guilt that I, that I have tied in that I haven't been able to be the same um, father to my son that I was with my daughter, you know, um, and particularly that, that father and son bond, you think it is um, is extremely important and critical. So, yeah, um, I guess I've I've learned that um, sometimes you, you can't have the best of both worlds. Um, I think that I've I've learned to understand that they're their own humans um, and not to portray my expectations of, of um, what I wanted to be as a kid onto them. Um, but then also there's, there's, a, there's a really um, challenging um, scenario that growing up um, we didn't have too much, um, so you want to provide a better life for your kids. And then when you provide that, um, you look at it out of, almost out of um, a, a perspective of, how do we create adversity for these kids so that they could be as driven as I am? Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, there, there's a real conflict there, um, and I'm sure there's many parents that that sort of feel that way and think that way, um, and I think that's normal. Um, we don't understand that their challenges, and and I think that they still have a similar level of of challenge. Um, for them, their challenge may seem in, insignificant to us, but the emotions they have are exactly the same as we had. You know, so. That's hard for me to understand sometimes and 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 work through, but um, yeah, just patience. I think um, and being their friend um, and and trying to listen to them and and um, you know I haven't been that great um, with this um, for, for a wee while, but I remember being um, asked by somebody, um, "How do you look at your child the first time you see them in the morning or when you pick them up from the school?" And I was just like, "Oh shit." Because that's 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 who they see back, you know. They, they, how do you how do you look at your kids? What's the first thing that you say to them in the morning? I'm like, man, okay, I want to be, I want to be portraying that I love them unconditionally, that everything's going to be good, that they that I'm there for them. So, yeah, man, parenting's um, challenging, man, and it's awesome, most rewarding thing. But yeah, yeah, I don't think there's a perfect script on how you can be a parent. Man, that's one of the most articulate. <laughs> Brilliant answers <laughs> that we've ever had on this podcast. That was that was amazing. I've got one more, um, and it's a again, it's a tricky one. F- favorite failure? Do you have a, a failure that is you, a lot of people grow from failures um, that they make them better people? Is there one that you have that you look back on and think that 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 was a, a good failure? Um, yeah, um, yeah. D- depends on how you frame failure. Um, yeah, yeah. I I guess there's there's been many failures in in my life, and and um, yeah, I, I don't think I can single out one, f- and, and and I don't necessarily frame things as as a failure because I've I've you know, I've learnt that um, that's an opportunity for me to learn and reframe um, how I get to my goals. You know, um, yeah. I I'm not somebody that gets extremely embarrassed. Um, I, I learned when I was playing footy that if you're, if you're willing to take the, the accolades that come, um, then you've got to take the criticism that comes as well. So I was always trying to, somebody that was pretty, pretty level-headed the whole way through. Um, and that, part of that um, is because, again, I, d- 
didn't really care about anyone's perspective other than mine. Um, I was I was my own person on the island. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm I'm sure that there are um, failures probably in in relationships with people that mean um, a lot to me. That that um, yeah, I, I probably regret. Um, and you know, the, the, I'm fortunate that they're still around, and, and there's an opportunity for me to to make that right. But it's a cool question because it's made me think about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hell of a question to put on the spot. But <laughs> I was talking to Shay, I was like, you know, he's he's definitely uh, up to the challenge. Yeah, man. And thank you so much for sharing that. That was cool. Um, can I go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, go I'll, I'll lighten it up ever so slightly <laughs> yeah, with, with, a, with a couple of kind of interesting anecdotes that, that we skipped over. And it's, I'm going to dip back into rugby league yeah, man. Land. Let's and do that, it. And that was you putting like an all-star dream team together for the Point Chev Pirates. <laughs> and just, yeah, getting, yeah. just getting some of your mates together and... Yeah reversing the club's fortunes and taking it back to the glory days like how would an opposition player feel when he comes up to Walker Park and Wairangi Korpu's there Carl Tanana's there Stacey Jones is running the cutter at halfback <laughs> Monty Beatham's there yeah, yeah. Monster's, Monster's playing you're yeah, on the yeah. sideline Pete Ehrlich is running the water on. Like, it's, an, it's an amazing thing and yeah, was man. that just an excuse to get a good group of people together and spend time together on a weekend oh it actually come about um, so Stacey and I obviously played for Point Chev um, Stacey had just retired had been retired for, for a year Stacey came back and played at the Warriors after he did a stint over in England and um, we went back to the club rooms um, for the senior prize giving one night um, and there was no senior players back there. You know, it was just the kids. And we felt that we had a responsibility to, to go back and help our, help our footy club. Um, so we sort of put together a plan. At that stage, they'd won, I believe, one senior um, match in the last two or three years. Um, they were the, the bottom team of the bottom division in the Auckland competition. And it was three divisions. So, um, we, yeah, we went back and, and we, um, yeah, Felt it our duty to go back and help, and uh, in doing so, yeah, we pulled together a, a bit of a crew, and and um, it was a good opportunity, yeah, to, to get a cool crew together. We had guys that were um, from other clubs or, or were in the in the environment at the time, the Point Chev team, and again, it was giving them a, an amazing experience, and and um, yeah, just just changed um, the focus, uh, I guess, for for that low division of, of footy, and, and there was a lot of people turning out to watch games. You know, it was. It was fun, man. It was it was a uh, it was a great um, great environment, and, and I learned so much um, from coaching back then, and um, and being in a an environment where people are giving up their time um, to serve a purpose they, they strongly believe in, um, and yeah, I could only I could only stay there one year. Uh, for me, it was um, extremely um, well intended. Um, but again, you've got to have um, the right leadership at the at the top to make things um, flow down. But um, yeah, um, Stacey um, kept on as coach the following year. We won the won the bottom division, went up to second division. Stacey um, won that, and then got up to the to the um, Fox Memorial, and, and then Point Chev have been the most dominant team over the last ten years up there. Man, it's it's a pretty cool um, pretty cool journey, and and uh, it was interesting. So so the. Um, the chairman of the Warriors now, um, Kenny Rainsfield, he was our wrestling coach and, and a good friend of, of mine and Stacey's. And um, he was saying that one of his mates, um, Mark Robinson, um, used to be a point share boy and family was into league and stuff. And, and after we won that first comp that we should catch up with him and, and have a chat about sponsorship. And so uh, we went up to the malt bar up in Greyland, uh, Westland, and, and caught up with him and you know, had a chat and sort of, Got him on board, and he was like, "All right, so how much um, how much is going to cost me to, to get involved with this team?" I think we had five thousand dollars a year before to do it, and, uh, and again, make it up on the spot and come up with a number and and hustled him. And uh, I don't know, we managed to get you know, twenty grand or something together, and and um, from that moment, he's he's put a lot of money into the Point Chev Pirates, and and um, obviously um, found his love and passion for supporting a, a rugby league club, and um, and it's no surprise that he jumped on and and is now. You know, the owner of the Warriors and, and pumping a lot of money in, into that direction. The the other one that we I feel like we skip over this fact for a lot of guests that we've had on, but it's meeting royalty, and it's it's meeting the Queen, which you had the opportunity with the All Goals overseas. What's that actually like? Because not that many people get the chance to go to Buckingham Palace and have an audience with the Queen. We had a guy. Dave Wooden here, who used to prepare salmon for Prince Charles, and he sort of just said it nonchalantly, like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> Prince you know, now King Charles, of course." So, what's take us to Buckingham Palace and, and kind of that experience? Yeah, man, that was that was pretty cool. I think we only we only found out um, maybe a week or so prior. Um, 
maybe it was longer, but I didn't listen. Um, anyway, we, we jump on the bus and you go in there and they sort of um, give you a briefing um, about the media that's going to be there with the with the league team. And um, we were the first rugby league team to, to sort of go into Buckingham Palace and, and um, that we're going to meet the Queen. And then we get there and the security uh, from Buckingham Palace come on the bus and they give you sort of the rundown on what you can and can't do. And um, then they walk us through into, into Buckingham Palace and it's amazing. Obviously, it's you know, um, extremely ornate and all these... Um, marble floors everywhere and the walls are just covered with what it seems like um, velvet and, and everything just looks so luxurious and all these amazing paintings that we have no idea what they are in these portraits but obviously they're, they're really fancy and then we go into um, this, this big banquet room and um, and then they uh, they brief us again about when the Queen comes in what will happen and um, they say okay so what will happen is the doors will burst open, you'll hear these trumpets playing and then these corgis will come running in um, and then when the Queen comes around, um, you're not allowed to look her in the eye. Mm. I say that to Stephen a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you bow your head and you shake your hand and you don't ask her a question. You can answer a question but not ask. Prince Philip will come around as well and you do the same and um, and then the royal party will, will follow and we're like, okay, that's cool. So we're, we're in this um, banquet room and, and they've got all these beautiful paintings and like I said, extremely ornate. And, um, and we're standing around waiting, waiting, waiting and then I notice... Um, a few of the Polynesian boys going up and getting cups of tea. I'm like, that's kind of weird. They don't usually drink hot drinks. It's interesting. So, so you see them go up two or three times. And I'm like, shit, boys, what's up with these cups of tea, man? And they're like, oh, every time you get a cup of tea, la, you get a royal teaspoon. <laughs> I'm like, shit, no way. All right, I'm going to get one. So I go up to get my royal teaspoon. As I do, <laughs> the bloody doors open, the corgis come running in and we've got to go get our spot. And because I was right next to um, where they were serving up um, these beautiful um, club sandwiches and cups of tea, I end up being at the front of the line. So I'm at the front of the line. Ruben Wickie's there as our captain. So the Queen comes in. Ruben's the most nervous I've ever seen him. He can't even get words out to introduce who we are and stuff. So the Queen comes around, Prince Philip comes around, shake hands and stuff and... And I guess the uh, the really cool thing is we're the first group ever to do the haka inside Buckingham Palace. We got that opportunity, which was which was amazing. So we go out, out outside of the, the banquet room into this big foyer that um, would have hosted so many so many um, events, and and we're there. And the Queen's sort of two stairs up, and um, she's there and she's ready. Come on, Rubens, come on, hey, hang up, pucky, yeah, start slapping our legs. And of course, all the boys with the teaspoons, you hear this <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So the, so the boys doing the haka, they've got their elbows on their pockets so the, so the teaspoons don't jingle. And they're doing the haka, the first time ever doing the haka in Buckingham Palace. And it's the most awkward, unco, <laughs> non threatening haka you've ever seen. So going through it, oh, fitu tera, a few of us, nah. And then one of the boys, Clinton Torpy, forgets we no longer do the haka jump. And of course, he does the hucker jump. He's got the most <laughs> teaspoons in his pocket. Elbows come off the pockets. Hands in the air. Teaspoons hit the marble floor. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and the queen looks straight over him, at him. And you know when your mum looks at you with that disapproving look? Imagine the queen looking at you with that disapproving look. And we're like, oh, you're in trouble, boy. And without skipping a beat, he picks up the teaspoons, puts them in his pocket, and goes, what? You stole our land. <laughs> He must have that line prepared. Yeah, yeah. Come out that on the spot. He's thinking, if this ever comes to him, yeah. I've got a line lined up. I've got a line lined up. <laughs> so it was awesome. So, yeah, so the boys uh, ended up with all the teaspoons. I didn't get one. So, um, yeah, there'll be a few, few royal teaspoons out in South Auckland. <laughs> Fuck, that's, oh, a good, good. that's a good Queen story. Good, that's good. a good Queen story. Um, right, last one before me, before uh, Shay wraps up. We've got to talk golf. I found myself oh. I found myself in these YouTube rabbit holes when we have guests on. I type your name into YouTube. And I found myself watching you play a round of golf about seven years ago <laughs> on the golf show. I'm like, oh, what's he going with you? Oh, seven iron, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what's the golf handicap at these days and what was it at its highest? Oh, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm at a 10, uh, 10 at the moment. Um, I'm a little reluctant to, to play a bit more. We have a few golf tournaments that I'm involved with. Yeah, and, Aotearoa um, Invitational? Uh, Aotearoa Invitational, yeah. We, we put that on in conjunction with um, good friends of mine, Nathan McCallum and Chris Brebner, who own Total Property Works. Um, and that, we've raised funds for, um, you know, for, for great causes and, and um, you know, the Friends in Construction is, is sort of what we've done, done it for the last two years, Mates in Construction, um, which has been great. And um, yeah, we do it uh, every year, which is, which is pretty cool. But 
Yeah, um, we have a, have a few other tournaments that, that are pretty uh, pretty significant in the golfing calendar for uh, for the ones that are involved. And, and so you don't want your handicap too low. Yeah, um, okay. But my handicap, yeah, maybe six months ago was 16. Um, but okay. when I when I wasn't um, yeah, working full time um, and just doing the Sky TV stuff, it was it was sort of around that that uh, number anyway because I was playing a couple of times a week. But yeah, yeah, it's good, man. I, I love my golf. Um, try and get up to uh, Tiara Links um, at least once a week and play up there. The new course up in Mangafai, it's beautiful. You know, just unreal and and. Um, Take the, yeah. he- take the helicopter there? <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite, man. Not quite. No, no. Can't, can't get up there at the moment with the bloody roads. So, oh, yeah. um, no, it's 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 pretty um, pretty special. You know, that was one of the things I, I thought of uh, thought of spoiling myself with is, is joining, getting a membership up there, and and um, being able to take mates of mine up to give them an, an experience they might not never have e- either. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. You got my number, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, we got to do it. Um, look, I'm just going to say a little mini outro before I throw to Shay. This has been such an epic uh, episode. Like the highs and lows, the the, the deep and meaningfuls, the the great yarns. Uh, so cool. Thank you for giving us your time. Like I've learned so much about you. And oh, it's so it's easy, been man. like a, an, an awesome ride. And I know <laughs> the audience is going to love it. But I'm not the outro guy. It's Shay. Oh, man. Um, you, you spoke about being on your own island, and it must be an incredible island that you discovered through adversity at such a young age. And on the surface, I think it seems like a rugby league chat and a, and a view of your greatest hits. But Mel Robinson was right. Like the depth of your character, um, the vulnerability that you've shared, uh, the, the rawness, your thoughts on life, particularly your thoughts on fatherhood and love for your wife and for your family, have been amazing and I'm so thankful that an audience gets to hear this because you've got some incredible wisdoms which have been built up through an amazing body of work and obviously a great foundation through your formative years but as well as that you have an incredible love of life and seem like the kind of guy that just enjoys having good times as well and to have that balance between such an articulate and thoughtful person who loves a good time it just seems like the perfect match. And I was coming into this thinking it would be a rugby league chat and it's just lessons in life. So thank you very much for sharing some time with us. It's been incredible. And I would love to spend more time with you and, and sit down and pick your brain without a microphone and, and just shoot the shit because you seem like an incredible dude. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Cheers, man. I, I really have enjoyed this. And yeah, I, I, I sort of shy away from anything like this, but I thought, yeah, man, this uh, again, um, you'd, do something that scares me and I've sort of hidden myself for a while. So this is, uh, this has been nice, man. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thanks, Owen. Cheers, bro.